Okay, we're recording. This is Wrong Speed Record Chat number 35. And today we have Aaron Turner. How are you Hello, doing? Bro. I'm good. How are you? <laughs> good, good, good. Where are you? I'm uh, on Vashon Island, which is um, outside Seattle. And that's where I live. Okay, I, I, I knew it was Vashon. I didn't realize it was an island. It is. Oh, I don't know my geography. It's not, it's not far off the mainland, but it is actually an island. Wow. It, 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 can you drive there? Would you need to get a bike? Not. You have to take a ferry. Oh, really? Yep. Okay. This is sounding awesome. And you're living in the woods, you told me. Yeah. And it would be overrun by people if you could drive here, but the ferry is a pain in the ass. So it, it, it provides a little bit of a buffer. <laughs> God, that's awesome. I didn't realize that. Okay, cool. Um, so um, I think we first met when um, you very, very kindly asked the band I do to play some dates with Sumac in Europe. Yes, although we'd had correspondence many years prior. Yeah, that's it. Um, I, I think I'd, I think I was, um, what's the word? Um, I was Googling my own band name. <laughs> so I, can put it, I can put it no other way. <laughs> I know it's embarrassing, but I saw, and then I saw that you'd mentioned um, R R R, one of our records from way back in time. I think it was on a blog or something, and then uh, yeah, we got in touch after that. And I thought that sounds excellent <laughs> that you've mentioned yeah. it. And then well, you were, oh, yeah. yeah, and and uh, like I would say about eighty percent of my relationships as an adult. Um, my contact with you and our conversation was started around music and records. So yeah, it's the way it is, the, con the connection through music. Yeah. Yeah. That's about right. Isn't it? <laughs> Universal and its potency. Yeah. Love it. Um, so we went and we played four or five shows with you in Europe. I normally keep posters and things, but for some reason I can't find any apart from one. Uh -huh. It's not even a poster. It's the tiniest of flyers. So it's not even going to show up. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, it was we're, on, we're on there somewhere. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> okay, so it's super blurry. And it's a place called Juha West, J U H A West. And it was, a, this was a venue in Stuttgart. Yep. I'm familiar with it. And I thought it was a brilliant venue. Uh huh. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I've been there multiple times. You have, right. Yeah. That was the only time we've been. And it was eye opening in its excellence, actually. I love the setup there. Yeah. So over those dates, we played a variety of different places, didn't we? This was uh, more like, a, I want to say DIY-ish. It had that sort of vibe to it. Yeah. Up to like up to like venues that were way beyond our reach normally. So that was a total privilege. Which do you prefer? Uh, I don't have a specific preference. It's more just about how the show itself goes. Uh, I've certainly played um, what would be considered uh, very terrible venues and had great experiences. And I've played some prestigious places that I was hoping would be amazing and turned out to be complete duds. Um, and so there's a whole, there's a whole um, array of different factors that come together in, in creating either a good or a terrible show. Uh, mm -hmm. Acoustics, chemistry amongst band members, chemistry between audience and performer, um, how the day leading up to the show has gone, who else is performing. I mean, there's so many contributing factors. I can't really, I can't really define a set of parameters for the ideal show. No, right, of course. Yeah, I get that. But um, um, what I liked, just, just going back to this one, what I liked about this one is I had a shower the minute after we played. You, uh -huh. <laughs> you just started playing and I was in the shower underneath the stage and I felt like John Bon Jovi. <laughs> <laughs> and then and then within minutes I was up watching you play clean. Sometimes <laughs> simple amenities make a very big difference. And it stuck with me because this was like three years ago or whatever. It's really Yeah. Big. And certainly cleanliness is not high on the list of things that you're usually able to achieve in a venue setting. No, 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 it was really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, you 
run two labels still or just the one now? Um, Hydrahead is, is in its final death throes at this point. Okay. Um, I'm, I've been purposely shutting it down, but it's not something that I could do um, with any sort of immediate finality. It's taking a lot of steps to kind of get it to the place where it's officially done. And even at that point, I think it'll, I'll still continue it on in some very limited capacity, like, you know, to sell off old stock and test presses and I'll keep running the social media accounts, maybe just for historical purposes only, just put up really old releases from the back catalog every once in a while to highlight. Um, but it is no longer an active label. Uh, and Siege, which I co-run with my partner, Faith, is very much an active enterprise at the moment. Right. Um, and um, its level of activity is somewhat determined by my tour schedule. Um, when I'm on tour, we're not able to do as much. So the last year and a half, we've been very active. Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's our current status. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you've, um, how is touring? I mean, you're, you have a child now, so. Four and a half, yeah. Four and a half. So does that affect your uh, touring? And um, Yes and no. I mean, at the end of, uh, the end of ISIS, um, I realized that I didn't ever, that I didn't want to continue touring extensively no matter what band I was in. Um, we had done several years of tours that were often six or seven or eight weeks long. And that's for me um, past the point of being enjoyable and into the terrain of just being a chore. Um, that feels more perfunctory than it feels creative. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I had made that decision back in 2010 or 11, never to tour beyond what felt enjoyable. Uh, and this was, of course, prior to me having a child. Um, so, so that idea of kind of diminishing the length of tours that I was doing was already there by the time he was born. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once he was out in the world, um, it wasn't much of an adjustment with me. I felt like I could still tour as much as I wanted mm -hmm. to be able to tour and uh, as much as I needed to, to be helpful on a financial level, but not so much that I felt like I was an absentee parent. Yes, I know that feeling. Even if I go away for a long weekend, I, I can sometimes feel that, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got a couple of records that you're on here. I'm going to show sure. them quickly, if that's okay. Yep, um, absolutely. Kind of roughly in order. Um, and uh, this is the uh, ISIS album there. Um, Oceanic, of course. Um, this was um, surprisingly enormous in our world over here, this record. Like everyone had it and it was a really big deal. It's yeah, so we, didn't, we didn't realize that until we played London for the first time, which I think was 2003, maybe. Um, shortly after that album had been released and there was far more people at that show than pretty much anywhere we played stateside so that was quite a pleasant surprise for us yeah it was it was a really big deal though like everyone like wasn't just like metal people you know, uh -huh. it totally like seemed to go beyond that world you know it was yeah it was a really important record at the time i mean I don't mind admitting we ripped off a little. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't mind admitting that we ripped off a few people in making that record. Um, uh, I, I guess I'll make a distinction. Um, I, I feel like there can be ripping off and then influenced by. And I think we started off as a band that was ripping off and became a band that was being influenced by other yeah. things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go with that as well, however <laughs> untrue it is. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the next one, and this almost had the same effect as that, um, was the uh, this Old Man Gloom album. Uh -huh. um, yeah, it was the same people getting right into it. it was, yeah. And, and I, I, I do follow your, uh, is it 
the Facebook page. I don't know who runs the old Mandolin Facebook. Sa- Santos, our drummer. He seems he to have our, fun with our, that. Yeah, our, our PR, the face of our uh, worldwide PR. <laughs> <laughs> he has uh, a <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, Old Man Gloom never made it to Europe um, during the peak of our popularity. By the time we made it to Europe, finally, I believe we were somewhat old news, including in the UK, which is uh, notorious for um, essentially throwing bands by the wayside once the initial wave of hype has died down. So uh, we still managed to have some good experiences, but I think we're considered uh, a geriatric band at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this was again, but it was a big record. Like, you know, if I listen to it, I'm still surprised how good it is. And then I'm just going to race through these because uh, yeah, we've, probably... we've, there's many records to discuss. Just I know I've only well, got a couple past more. them. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a couple more, and it's this. I really like this one here. Uh, ah, yeah, the best Mamifer. side of the show. <laughs> I don't know. What yeah, I'm... Mammifer House of Low Culture split. Yes, I really, really like. Um, actually, um, uh, I uh, uh, this is it's going to sound bad. I really like the side you're not on. <laughs> 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 no, that's fine. I, some of my favorite material from Mammoth are the are the songs or albums I'm not on, simply because I don't have to. Um, I, well, I'll put it this way: I have a very hard time being objective about the things in which I'm a participant. So sometimes it's nice to be part of a project that I can really thoroughly enjoy when yeah. I'm not participating in every single thing that that project does. Yeah, right. Um, I, I love the piano on it. So that's what I really like. It's Me just, too. Yeah, it just sounds so nice. And that, uh, am I correct? This is something else I really like, just as a, on a nerdy level. I love the fact that the information is printed on the inside, oh, you can't really see it, on the inside of the sleeve. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, our friend Ari Makelbos did the artwork, that collage, and it just, we felt the artwork was um, best left unadulterated. So, that's actually the back of the collage itself. Those are all cut up pieces from magazines. And so what's on the back is actually what's on the back of the piece that you can see on the front. Oh, right. Okay, cool. Yeah, so this is on your label, Siege. Siege, Siege yeah. Siege, S-I-G. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was one of our uh, earliest releases. Right, yeah. And I'm correct, it's your partner, right? Yeah, right. Faith and I, Faith and I run that together. Uh, it was essentially her idea, and um, I have been her co-collaborator um, since since the beginning. Essentially, Mammifer she started before I was involved, but Siege we essentially started together under her direction. Cool. Yeah. Well, it's awesome. And the last thing I've got here that you're on that I just want to quickly talk about because I want to know how it came about, and. I'm guessing you must have recorded it totally separately. And it's the uh, Pharaoh Overlord album on Rocket. Yes. Um, yes, so UC uh, and I have a history together of, of uh, being serial collaborators in a number of different projects. Um, and many of them have been at least initiated in person. This was, I think, the only one we've done uh, together that we weren't actually in physical proximity to one another during some phase of the project. Yeah. Um, so it's very much a quarantine record in that sense. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, UC and Tommy, uh, who um, are basically comprised the core of Pharaoh Overlord at this point, they initiated the record together and sent me the pieces and we put it together. Mm. Sweet looking record. <laughs> um, this um, is a real grower of a record. I think it's quite shocking when people first hear it. <laughs> it, was a, it, was, it was a grower for me as well. I didn't really understand what we were doing or how I could fit in. <laughs> I just started working on it without analyzing the results. And then I think it was somewhere after it had been mastered and we were pretty far along in the process that I was able to actually um, enjoy what had happened and and really understand that it was good rather than just an ex, an experiment that happened <laughs> it's properly good though like it, it, it um i love them 
the combination somehow works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't like it does though. I don't know. Yeah. I don't quite know how because I wouldn't have said it would have before. Uh, I didn't. I didn't know either. I, I when UC said that the material was so melodic and I really didn't feel like singing um, melodically, and I I don't do that very often. Yeah. Um, I just I don't I've never truly felt comfortable as a singer in the more traditional sense and so I proposed the idea to UC of just approaching it from the harsher end of the spectrum and he was um, absolutely on board with the idea as he is with most things that seem like they could be inappropriate. <laughs> yeah but anyhow if, if anyone's watching this and they haven't checked out that album do like it's on rocket recordings and it's quite something but it's really really excellent um and just just quickly four releases that you've released that you're okay not, and and i love all four of these um they're on both labels um okay so first of all pharaoh overlord album yep um love this record we we played with them about three or four years before this came out 2012 is that correct that sounds right yeah, yeah. We played with them about three or four years before that. Um, and these were the songs that they played. Yeah. So were, for whatever reason, it took that long for this to come out. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I feel like they're always ahead of of themselves in every sense. They're, whatever is finished has already been forgotten in favor of what's coming next. And uh, the output of that whole group is so prolific that I feel like sometimes, you know, things either come out immediately, you know, by the time, you know, they've finished recording, it's already in the process of being released, or sometimes things take a while to actually, for someone to remember that there's a record that's finished that needs to be <laughs> ushered into the world, so. Oh yeah, we did that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is on Siege. Yep. Seems to imply you press 500 of them. That's Maybe right. more. Yeah, but, but. yeah our, our, our press runs are usually pretty small and that was part again, partly based on my own experience. Um, Hydrahead became a more of a professional label and while I enjoyed some of the um, results of having a larger platform, I also felt that it was difficult to bear the weight of some artists expectations in terms of how we could help leverage their career um, and of course i'm i'm very much in favor of creating visibility for artists and um, and helping with resources but i also um, i get i start to feel like i get out of my depth and out of my um, area of interest once music ascends past the level of doing it for enjoyment and gets much more focused on the career end of the spectrum. And that was where I felt like I, I didn't want to go again when Faith and I were discussing Siege, like thinking about how to have, you know, international PR for radio and press and making videos and doing tour support. Like that just for me gets away from the, the core the core of, of creative practice and creative thought and more towards um, just basically being an administrator and a business person. Yeah. And I think there's a good middle ground between the two. Um, but I, as I said, I feel like there needs to be a balance. And for me, when it goes too far on the career end, it gets harder to, to find joy in it. The Hydra had got big, big, didn't it? It was like worldwide big. It did. And, and that, again, that was kind of, um, an inadvertent product of just doing what we enjoyed doing but it also was uh became troublesome uh later on because we were not professional enough to handle the level at which we were operating yeah yeah okay yeah that's not a musician's job to be professional is it yeah <laughs> you know with business i mean <laughs> yeah oh this is a record i love uh this is on hydrohead yeah and um yeah i absolutely love this record and on yes uh yeah they came along um towards the end of hydrahead doing new new releases new bands um but the, they were so compelling to me in what they were doing and in some way connected to what i felt was sort of the core 
um, creative ideology behind Hydrahead that it seemed necessary to work with them. Yeah. And uh, I'm very, very happy that we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an excellent record. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, we'll, we'll go circle. I love the art on this as well. <laughs> Yes, Tom, Tom Backstrom designed that, who is one of my favorite designers as well. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I, that was also sort, sort of towards the tail end of Hydrahead being a more active label. And I'm very glad we got to do at least one circle release. I wish we, I wish we had started working with them years earlier because they have been consistently one of my favorite bands and uh, they have many records that I wish we had taken part in releasing. Um, so I'm glad we got to do at least one. Yeah, I really like this. It's got that cover on it, doesn't it? What the, the um, uh, oh yeah, here come the warm jets. Yeah. <laughs> there, yeah, that group is always, um, Pharaoh Lord and Circle always uh, excel in the department of cover songs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, just quickly then, Oxbow album. I can't see it. Back to me. This is an incredible record. What Agreed. Record? And and same thing. Uh, that was coming at a stage in Hydrahead's arc where I wasn't really interested in taking on new things, but I had maintained contact with Eugene um, simply because we've had a long history together, touring together um, uh, and communicating and collaborating and uh, he was telling me that they were you know getting close to finishing another record and they didn't have a label and I just it it pained me to think of them not having a good home for that record and so I, I told them that I would be interested in taking it on and um, it was again another one that was well worth the effort even if I wasn't uh, doing that much else with Hydrahead at the time. Yeah. It's, it's, um, I, I... It sort of passed me by initially. It had been out for about six months and we were playing in um, Paris. We stayed at um, the promoter's house. Um, uh, and woke up in the morning, like on the floor, classic, classic uh -huh. situation. <laughs> His cat was like lapping at my head. But the music, <laughs> the music in the background, I was like, what the hell is this? Because it sounded like, it had like a Nick Cavey sort of sound but it, you know you know not really and i just couldn't place it and when he said yeah. it was oxbow i was like like that is incredible and i can't believe because <laughs> that's not what you know it's a real switch up for him i thought it's yeah and they, they've had a slow evolution i mean they've been a band for a long time now and and there has been a obvious uh evolution to their um aesthetics however i feel like there's a core of their musical persona that's remained intact. So it's not, um, it feels like an authentic evolution rather than a band that, you know, is just trying to switch it up for the sake of, um, for the sake of it. And it really just feels like they need to follow, um, they need to follow the thread of their own creative trajectory wherever it might lead them. And I would also say that some of it is a product of aging. Um, I, I don't think they could um, play the same way they did 40 years ago and have it be convincing. It's it's now a reflection of where they are at this moment in their lives. And uh, they're again, uh, along with Circle, one of my longtime favorite bands and favorite people to work with. Yeah, I don't doubt. and I love the sleeve as well, by the way. The sleeve is really nice. The embossed nature of the, was it slightly embossed? The sleeve yeah. is really nice. Uh -huh. The feel of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Again, 500 copies. Second press. Yeah, I think, I think we ended up repressing that one. But, um, you know, that was coming at a time when Oxbow hadn't been active for a while. And, um, you know, their, their existence is consistent, but their activity is intermittent. So we weren't really sure what to expect. And I was also at a place with the label where I didn't want to overpress records. I would rather sell through a pressing and, you know, have further demand than be sitting on piles of stock, which is exactly what started to bring the label down in the first place. Yeah, I can't imagine there's anything more depressing than seeing 5,000 copies of the same CD in the corner. Of yeah, the and CDs, honestly, were part of what killed it. I mean, uh, you know, there was 
a time where CDs were 90% of our sales. And then there was a time where unexpectedly the demand for CDs dropped off very rapidly just over the course of about two years and we got flooded with returns. And that was, um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we weren't always the most professional label, but um, you know, that was really unexpected for us. And part of what killed us on, a, uh, on the business level was just massive, massive returns over a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I did end up uh, recycling thousands and thousands and thousands of CDs. I mean, we, we literally couldn't get rid of them any other way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I absolutely understandable. You just, yeah. don't, you just don't want that stuff lying around in the end. Do you? As, as good as the music but is, you can't have it. Yeah. You can't, and you have to pay for the space to store it. And yeah, yeah. anyway. Yeah, that's off. that happened, and yeah. I learned a lesson from it. <laughs> <laughs> let's um, let's switch and talk about some of your records then, rather than me just constantly showing stuff. Sure. Um, <laughs> um, so I have a list. I'll go through them, and you can you can work around the list or do however however the hell you want. Sure. So I'll start, and you you go with whatever. So okay. I like to talk about your favorite record shop. Favorite record shop. Um, this connects directly to you. Uh, Aquarius Records oh. in San Francisco no longer exists, but I have a hard time imagining there will ever be a record shop that was as important for me as Aquarius. Right. Um, if I could have imagined a store that was carrying exactly what I wanted, as well as things that I didn't know I wanted, but ended up needing, it would have been <laughs> Aquarius, um, especially because two of their primary areas of interest were experimental music and metal music. Um, and of course they carried a bit of everything else as well, but those have been my two primary areas of interest. Yeah. And they always were getting things from the far reaches of the globe and um, were extremely knowledgeable about music and, and passionate about talking about it. And I ended up becoming friends um, with at least a few of the staff there, especially Andy. And um, he and I share a lot of similar musical tastes. And so he was constantly recommending things. And um, he also liked a lot of what we were doing. So we were doing trading a lot of the time. And it was just a really, a really great connection for me. Um, and he either he, he directly or maybe just one of the, through one of their newsletters highlighted uh, Hey Colossus release. And that was how I first became aware of your music. <laughs> cool. um, and he had mentioned the, the packaging as well, which was the spray painted stenciled packaging for one of your records. And that was one of the things that always appealed to me was when people's hands were directly involved in the making of the physical object. Mm -hmm. And so uh, his, their description of the music plus the allure of, of seeing this packaging firsthand was what exposed me to your music. Um, but I feel like nothing, nothing has come along to fill the void left by Aquarius. And I still talk to Andy about it all the time. Just, um, you know, I understand his passion and his ability for running the store ran out, which is, you know, it happens. Um, but uh, I wish that there was some, some, something that, uh, could have could have happened to let the store continue on as it was. Where was it? Uh, I was in San Francisco, and it was a long running store. I think it had been started in the '60s, um, and I think it had always specialized in the more out end of the spectrum. And it had gone through a succession of different owners. I don't know how many people owned it, but Andy and Alan were the two owners at the end. Um, and I think it is this, this, the space itself has now turned it into, um, has now been turned into the stranded record shop, um, oh, which yeah. is also uh, has a lot of things in it that are of interest to me, but it's totally different in its character. That would explain something. I used to be on the Aquarius mailing list. Uh huh. And um, so, yeah, I've never went to the shop, never been to San Francisco or anything, but yeah. it was on the list and it was always, it would inspire me to buy things if I could find them over here or whatever. Yeah, then, but that would explain why I'm on the, why I'm on the stranded mailing list. I mean, never, <laughs> it just started. <laughs> no idea. Yeah, 
Uh, I was in Boston for many of the years that Aquarius existed. However, when whenever I was on tour, I always made a point of going to Aquarius when we had our stops in the Bay Area. Uh, so I was in the shop very, very frequently and getting records from afar when I was on the other side of the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd love to have gone there. Never went there. I've never been to Amoeba or anything. So I've always wanted to go there. Just another another good one. Yeah, the experience and whatnot. I'd like to yeah. spend a day in there. <laughs> I have not been in a record shop since uh, shutdown last year. So I'm looking forward to returning. Yeah, I did. I did go into anyhow, whatever. I did go into one yesterday or the day before. I bought a Cabaret Voltaire album just because I was uh -huh. like, I'm, I've got to get something. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm so excited to be there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so. Um, what records have you got there then? Let, hit me with something that uh, you want to talk about. Want to want to go through them all, or just start with one, yeah, or one and, and see see how you get on? Yeah, yeah. I'm just gonna pick from the top of the pile and go through and go through, and we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, this this may be the most controversial of the bunch. Uh, Megadeth, <laughs> rest in peace. Okay. Um, so even amongst devotees of 80s and early 90s thrash megadeth are are divisive yes. um because of dave mustaine both his singing voice as well as his ridiculous politics um and uh you know he he has espoused some really reprehensible views on the world um, and it's hard for me to reconcile that with the immense joy that I have derived from listening to Megadeth <laughs> in my life. Uh, I first encountered them probably around age 12 or 13, shortly after I discovered Metallica. Uh, and, and overall, Metallica might be more dear to my heart, but that Megadeth record has never gotten old for me. I can still listen to it. I still enjoy it. I still remember being incredibly frustrated trying to learn how to play the riffs from the record. Um, and I call, I've also kind of enjoyed the spirited conversations I've had with many people about, you know, either how great Megadeth is or what a fucking terrible band they are and what a piece of shit Dave Mustaine is. So <laughs> Um, I don't know if I'm a Megadeth apologist, but I am certainly an enthusiast about that record in particular. Yeah. Um, and it represents just a really potent part of my um, journey into becoming a musician as well. I'd been playing guitar for several years before that record came out, um, but it was a, uh, around the same time that Slayer's Seasons in the Abyss and Anthrax's Persistence of Time came out. And then they did that Clash of the Titans tour together, which for me was like a culmination of everything I loved at that time. Oh, yeah. um, so that was definitely like, I kind of from the point where I transitioned in uh, from being interested in playing guitar into being just like slavishly devoted to the practice of playing guitar and, and wanting to find a way to make my life based around playing guitar. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting that you, you, you've come into those bands at that point, which is what well, that must be their fourth or fifth albums in all their cases, right? Um, Persistence of time is like yeah, that. I think, yeah, that was probably around their fourth. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah arguably just after their classic period in all cases, right? Um, in theory, with, like in, with, in theory. Maybe with Megadeth, I don't know, because the, the record prior to that was Peace Cells, which is a good record, but uh, it's not as consistent. I would say this record it was the last great record they did, and maybe the first record they did that was truly consistent front to back. Mm -hmm. uh, other records had good songs, but I think were really spotty overall. Did So Far So Good So What have like that Sex Pistols cover on it? Is that, have, I, have I got that right? Had what? A Sex Pistols cover. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which at the time I loved and I look back on it now and it's a total groan, but. <laughs> <laughs> it is <a> total buzzkill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah um, but it, it comes up a lot, this. It's the. It's, uh, um, the first record you buy by a band is oft, often ends up being your favorite just because it's the one you've bought at the time it's come out and it's hit you yeah. at 15 or 16. Yeah. And then you'll go and talk to someone who loves Anthrax and they're like, 
what are you talking about <laughs> yeah. you know, or, or whatever it's like come yeah. on <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah but like you just fight your corner it's like up yours this is the one <laughs> yeah and, and records are obviously a very subjective thing and they have to do with the context in which they entered your life and there's yeah. no way to to take that factor out of the experience of the record itself so yeah exactly yeah as, almost as important it's like yeah absolutely yeah um Next would be um, more regionally relevant to you, perhaps the Bugs London Zoo. Love that. Um, I enjoyed a lot of uh, the Bugs music um, even prior to this record. The first full length on Reflex I thought was a really compelling record, um, yeah, but this pressure. one, this one, uh, I think Pressure, yeah uh this one really just uh again just top to bottom is is a fantastic record and of course his uh his production is the um the thing around which everything else uh is built but i also like the different voices throughout the record um and it was my first exposure to some of these people too. Uh, Warrior Queen, um, Space Ape, Flo Dan. I, I mean, every MC on this record is awesome. And I subsequently started investigating their other work as well. Right. Um, and it led me down some different avenues. Um, I bet he would have loved he had, that. He'd probably love to hear that. Like, yeah. Yeah, and I and this record too is interesting because of Kevin's background. I know he, like some of the other people who have been really influential for me, like Justin Broderick, with with whom he's obviously worked as well, mm -hmm. have a background in um, metal essentially, or at least in heavy music, and have since gone off on different trajectories. Um, you know, into the realm of experimental music and, and in his case, um, you know, his own idiosyncratic um, version of dub. And uh, I find that really interesting too, because, um, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm creatively restless myself and being bound into one area of musical practice feels restricted to me. Um, and so it's always inspiring for me to see people who have traversed different boundaries successfully. Um, going back to Circle and Pharaoh Overlord, same thing. I mean, even just within those two projects, there's been a lot of expansion in different directions. I think, um, and, yeah. and, and in a way that feels authentic to me. I think that's the other thing is, is certainly you can point to mainstream bands who have tailored their aesthetic to the flavor of the moment, but with a lot of underground artists like Kevin Martin or Justin Broderick or Circle or whoever, it's much more about the creative desire of the person um, behind it and their need to find new ways of channeling their, their creative voice. And so uh, Kevin has uh, remained a, um, a source of inspiration there. Yeah, I love, I love the journey of a band. If you, if yeah. Because when we played, okay, so when we played with Sumac in those Europe dates, um you like am i right in thinking the first album was kind of um not what you were doing when we saw you like when we saw you it was way more like out there and it was way more like uh what's i don't know a radical or something it was it was really exciting to watch like it, it, yeah. felt, it felt like yeah. it was going off left and right in a way that we weren't expecting yeah i think uh i think we had to start with some some territories that we were at least um, vaguely familiar with in order to feel like we could uh, we could um, have a compelling voice, so to speak. Uh, and that was the springboard off of which we could begin to try out these other things, which we had begun on the first record, but didn't really have the experience to dive into more fully until we had played together as a unit and had different uh, uh, a different set of experiences and and um, some time to get comfortable playing with one another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah, it was pretty rad. It was it was interesting to see the audience as well. And I think it was eye opening for some of them. Well, I hope so. Yeah, in you know in a good way, of course. Yeah. Um, next up would be Coltrane's Blue Train. 
um, which, you know, at this point has kind of been co-opted into the world of uh, Starbucks background music, but of course was far more radical than that at the time it came into existence. Um, certainly not the most radical of his works, but for me, again, just talking about context and time and place in your life when you encounter something, this was a, a door opening for me. Mm -hmm. And it was the door into the world of enjoying jazz. Um, I had grown up in a, in a household where I heard a lot of that, but, uh, and I've mentioned this in other interviews, for a long time, it was basically just what I considered my dad's music and therefore completely uninteresting to me. And then for whatever reason, this record, when I was listening to it in headphones one summer, I was listening to it, you know, repeatedly. And there was just one moment where it just, it just opened up for me. And it's, it's uh, his, the beginning of his solo in the title cut. Um, and it just, uh, it really pierced me. And that was the beginning of my um, interest in jazz on a much more active level and kind of getting over my prejudice towards it as my parents' music. Um, and that led to a whole, uh, a whole new realm of listening, but then also a different way of thinking about playing music, which has had a ripple effect that can be, um, felt for me even in the, the current iteration of Sumac where um, improvisation and free playing has taken, um, has taken a much bigger, um, it's, it's become a focus rather than kind of like a, a peripheral element of what we were doing. And that is yeah. direct, directly related to this essentially. Yeah. Cause you've, so you did a, a record with, um, uh, high note two records yeah. yeah um i was wondering if you had this album here i do yep i i think i have all of the uh umbarchi uh o'rourke high note trio albums and those are awesome yeah i got through um, them they're brilliant <laughs> yeah uh and stylistically going in different directions um but uh uh also really heavy at times which for me is satisfying to hear yeah. uh, you know people approaching um approaching improv music with them with sort of um uh a desire to um i won't say modernize but incorporate influences from this century, <laughs> essentially moving it beyond kind of its roots or, or an imitative thing into a realm where it's, it's much more relevant to the current moment. Yeah, I was wondering how much of an influence this, these records have been on what you've been doing with Sumac. Um, I would say Hino in general, but also listening to those trio records was part of what gave me the idea that perhaps Sumac working with Hino could potentially work. Yeah. Um, and thinking, and, and when I was discussing that with Brian and Nick, those were some of the records I pointed to. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of Hino's music would have been relevant, but those records in particular, I think, um, they gave me the idea that, you know, if we were to work with him, you know, what we do could meld well with what he does, especially in the context of that trio with Jim and Oren. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love, I love Jim O'Rourke's bass playing. Uh -huh. <laughs> on these records. Yeah. It's yeah. Like a, sort of a repetition, but he doesn't mind scuffing a note and then makes, yeah. a, makes a thing of the scuff. And yeah. I hear it. Cause I like, I, I, I know when someone, I make enough mistakes my, myself to know when someone's making one and I'm yeah. and, and I can get right into it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's the, the, the rough edges that are appealing and the things that sound um, even like a band stumbling is what's what makes the, the overall thing more appealing. I think. Yeah. yeah you hear like, a, it's like 15 seconds where you can hear a question mark above all of that. Yeah. And then yeah. it switches and you're like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's the whole goes back to the whole idea that it's not the destination, it's the journey. And and again, it's sometimes when a unit or even a solo improviser is kind of flailing around, 
that that makes the impact of them arriving at something all the more satisfying. It's that it really what I feel is a more uh, humanistic experience of listening to music. It's not somebody presenting to you this polished version of their idea. It's really the person presenting themselves as they are in that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just can it can work really well. <laughs> yeah, not always, but even failure to me is more interesting than something that is successful, uh, um, but much more conventional. Yeah. Uh, that your your reference there brings me directly to another record in the stack, which is the first record I have by Oren. Oh yeah. Cool. Um, and I did not know what this was at the time that I purchased it. Uh, there was a couple record shops in Boston when I was living there, um, but one of them uh, in particular was important for me at the time. It was called Twisted Village and it was there for years and years. And it was pretty much only experimental music. Um, and this was at a time you know, before you could just go online and listen to anything. So it was either what you were learning about word of mouth, what you were reading about in magazines, what you might be able to listen to in the shop or they had on. Um, but I really just bought this on a whim. And uh, it was very eye-opening for me. Oren's approach to guitar uh, is very um, idiosyncratic. It's very recognizable. Um, his um, interest in and purposeful dedication to kind of subverting the, the purpose of guitar and taking it to its most abstract point uh, has been really inspiring for me. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, guitar is my central instrument of interest. It is often the focal point of a lot of the music I enjoy most. Um, and I've also really enjoyed listening to a lot of guitar players who are doing the wrong thing with their instrument oh, yeah. um, or, or, or purposely trying to find out what it can do besides being a vehicle for a delivery of a chord progression. Yeah. I, on that note, I was wondering if you, if, uh, if you uh, dug Harry Pussy. Yes. Is that... Uh, Build a pussy. Is that what that record is? It's one plus one. This one. This is oh, okay. This is just the one that I dragged out today. Just yep. Going I'm not. I'm not as familiar with that one, but Bill Orkut and Harry Pussy are are pretty interesting to me. Um, I got to play a couple shows with Bill in Europe um, before, right right at, towards the end of 2019. So before the pandemic really hit. Um, and it was nice to be able to see him play in person because I'd only ever heard his music recorded. Yeah. Uh, and especially his acoustic records have been of interest to me because his approach to acoustic guitar, going back to what we were just talking about and people doing the wrong things, his acoustic records are sometimes so violent that I fear for his instrument. I mean, it really sounds like he is trying to pull the strings off. Yeah, yeah. And the way that the records are recorded is kind of on the hot end of the spectrum. So it's not, he's not running an acoustic guitar through distortion, but you know, the production element of it creates like a caustic distorted sonic resonance that I find really appealing. Um, and again, it's kind of just like this, uh, the Harry Pussy occupies this ground between um, abstract and improv and and you know visceral rock music and for me that's like a, a prime area of interest yeah he just yeah i agree he really tears into his instrument you know in a way that yeah it's, it's like animalistic <laughs> yeah um along those lines i'll bring up another record next in the stack yeah the Band of Gypsies, which is actually busting out of its sleeve because it's so tattered. <laughs> uh, I inherited this particular copy from my older brother, um, who is largely responsible for my interest in music, at least early on. Gave me a lot of tapes with uh, Hendrix and, and Zeppelin, um, and maybe Sabbath as well, um, which was highly formative stuff for me. Um, but again, just going back to what we've been talking about, guitar players who've subverted their instrument. You know, of course it was partially gimmick, but I remember seeing 
one of the early copies of the debut experience record that says, you know, something like all distortion is intentional. Do not attempt to adjust your, your <laughs> phonograph player. And he was pretty radical, especially for someone who was so widely received in terms of his use of feedback and, you know, his complete willingness to destroy his compositions in the, in the live context. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the, uh, the almost cliche now um, rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. Um, but, you know, actually, I think that's terribly relevant at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but all that stuff for me was just really, really powerful. And that record, um, especially Machine Gun, were, were that record and the, the track Machine Gun were very important for me. Um, and I can point to specifically one song that was influenced by that. You know, there's his mimicking of the sound of a machine gun hmm. and that, that, um, that more rhythmic percussive approach to playing has shown up in many things that I've done, but especially the title cut on uh, Celestial as all just string raking in a very rhythmic, hmm. almost martial way. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, that's one of those things I can point to. I know where I got that and I know what it meant to me and it's continued to resonate for years and years afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I, I think if I had to pick in, in kind of the, the repertoire of artists who have influenced me, if I had to pick one who has been the most influential and, and not only in the early stages, but, but uh, up to the present day, it would certainly be Hendrix. Right, yeah, yeah. Guitarist, guitarist, right? Yeah, and you know, again, it's kind of a cliche, but I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting about him is that as as much as people have tried to copy him, there is no one that has ever sounded like him because he's kind of living proof of the fact that it is not what you play, it's not your instrument, it's not your technique, it's not your um, you know, your pedals, uh, it's not your training. It is really you, who you are that makes you sound the way you do. Mm -hmm. And the more you're tapping into what that actually is, rather than trying to emulate what someone else does, I think the more compelling it can be for, you know, people who are experiencing it. Yeah. We, uh, we talk about it with Stan, so my oldest son learning the guitar, as you know, because he's kind of got one of the, uh, ECG guitars, as we, we uh, discussed over email uh -huh. over about two years, but eventually it's yeah. so carefully. But um, we sometimes look at those uh, gear setups for guitarists or whatever, you know, like Kevin Shields' pedal boards and everything and whatever else. And you wonder about people who are just co completely copying what Kevin Shields has got there to try yeah. and get my bloody Valentine sound. And then yeah. hit one chord and it's like, yeah, no, it's not. And then you realize it is the person it, yeah all this stuff's there but unless you're actually that person you're not gonna it ain't gonna work yeah yeah and Hendrix I mean you know he had his preferences for what he liked but if especially if you look at live footage and even some studio stuff it's like he would actually just take whatever was lying around or what someone handed him and it didn't really matter if it was a 12 string or a flying v or you know uh, uh, Stratocaster or whatever it was it was always him immediately upon his body coming into contact with the instrument. Yeah, I think that's, that'd be the same for all of these people we've just talked about. I'm sure Bill Orcutt will sound like Bill Orcutt if he's on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're going to know, right? You're going to be like, yeah. oh, there's Bill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tearing the hell off that one. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, so. I'm getting to the part of the pile that's more recent discoveries for me. Cool. Um, not necessarily recent music in some cases. Uh, this one, uh, Shub Nagoroth, French, ostensibly a prog band. Um, this record from 86, from what I can tell. Uh, and it definitely it occupies the same territory as magma um, and it's from that sort of same school of thought however it is of a much darker strain and uh, for me 
more interesting. It kind of gets out of the territory of wacky and more into the territory of truly terrifying. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are some things in here that remind me of some records that I've released, not that I played on, but on the label like KO Dot, for instance, or um, James Plotkin's Caliste Project. And I wouldn't be surprised if neither of them had ever heard this record. It's more just that it was a group of people on kind of a parallel trajectory. Right. Uh, but a lot of the bass on the record is distorted, which, you know, was kind of an anomaly at that point. Mm -hmm. um, the compositions are, um, they're technical, but they're not technical for the sake of it. I really feel like it was just about what made that interesting for the people who are writing. Yeah. Uh, um, and it's really just dark, abstract music that has no clear parallels with anything else. And um, to my ear still, I've never heard anything else quite like it. What's it called again? Shub Nagorath, which I think is a reference to an HP Lovecraft uh, thing. And I could give a shit about Lovecraft. I mean, he's had an impact on things I like this, mm. uh, early Metallica, but I've never really cared one way or the other about his work. Um, but that was like a lot of things. When I first heard it, I was like, I don't know, but uh, this is really just kind of unsettling and and i'm not sure if i like it but that to me is almost more indicative of a reason to investigate than hearing something and instantly just gravitating to it i mean there's there's some things that i you know like right off the bat and continue to enjoy but most of my very significant musical interests have developed out of that initial reaction of uncertainty yeah i just at that point i'd love to I, this is about the fourth or fifth time i've mentioned this but that's exactly what happened with me and a bunch of people when we were about 15 with the Dimension Hatros album by Voivod. Yeah. <laughs> we did, had no idea. Yeah, we had no idea what we were listening to at the age of 15. Yeah. But, but stuck it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and those are the things that end up being really rewarding. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, next up, this is a fairly recent discovery as well. Pan American Native Front. Um, and it is uh, aesthetically in the realm of black metal. However, I think it's a, um, a refreshing step away from the sort of homogeneous, um, often uh, racist aspect of black metal. And it is, uh, it's a First Nations American person who is sort of using his cultural her heritage as the, the um, uh, the uh, sort of ideological ideological standpoint that the, the music is being built off. So aesthetically, it's related to black metal, but the subject matter, I think, is much more interesting yeah. um, and much more radical, actually, than, uh, than what's often associated with the genre. And for me, that, that's also interesting um, and satisfying, particular, particularly at this moment when... Uh, America has reached another apex of very extreme and overt racism. Mm. Um, and just thinking about just, you know, what I choose to consume and what, what is meaningful to support. And I have enjoyed a lot of black metal over the years, but of course the politics have been and continue to be uh, problematic with a lot of artists. Yeah. And um, I feel uh, that's, that's ever more important to consider. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's nice to be able to enjoy this on a visceral level, but also um, feel like I'm not supporting something that's essentially antithetical to my own worldview as it's yeah. supporting it. Yeah, what do, you, what do you think about like, his, like, I don't know, say when you were 18 and maybe you had a Burzum record or whatever. Uh, so for example, like now where you look at it and you think, ah, or you, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, with something like Burzum, it's pretty obvious, but, it, you know, then there's areas where it's harder to define because obviously you can't vet every single thing that you listen to mm. um, and you don't know the people involved. But I will say this, that, um, you know, uh, my own white privilege became very evident to me in 
in recent years when I just started realizing that, you know, I, I didn't take that aspect of black metal seriously enough. And I just kind of chalked it up to, you know, ignorance and, and really, you know, people trying to be edge lords essentially just to be as extreme as they could. And now I just, you know, um, I think a lot more, a lot more about what I choose to support, what I want to publicly support. I mean, and even in just like uh, thinking about what t-shirts I wear on stage, like I, I don't want to promote an artist who I know is directly opposed to what I believe is, is mm. um, ethical and what, you know, I want to uh, impart to my son, for instance um as a person you know parenting a child in this in this world and at this time um and the other thing i've realized is like you know uh, there's just so much music out there and so many important um artists who are making great work who aren't fucked up racist assholes that you know you don't i mean some people just you justify it by saying you know this is the music is just so good and i can understand that to a certain extent. And I can also understand that like, you know, as I said, you can't vet every single person who's making the music that you consume. But at another point, it's also like, well, the, the world is full of great music and, and there's plenty of things that you can support. And what you choose to support is an important choice in and of itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree, I agree. Why, why listen to racist black metal when you can listen to the bug? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, there's a there's a website here. <clears throat> um, well, it started in the U.S. and now the the editors are based in uh, Canada called Cult Nation. And Sean, the editor, and I were discussing some of this stuff, and he was like, you know, metal is a place where you know a lot of stuff isn't overtly racist, but racists feel comfortable there. Mm -hmm. And just you brought up Burism a few minutes ago. I can't think of the number of shows I've been to where people were wearing Burzum shirts yeah, and oh my God, yeah. uh, it's just a big, a big thing to consider and to discuss and not to, um, you know, start wars over, but just a thing to consider as a community. Why is this get a pass? Why is this okay? Why do people feel comfortable going to a metal show wearing a shirt from a band that is known to be blatantly racist. I mean, mm. it's, it's, it's one thing with certain bands, but Burzum is known there. I would say that it's, there's very few people who listen to Burzum who don't know that Varg is a fucked up guy <laughs> espousing some really terrible shit. Yeah. Yeah. He's a total wrong one. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I was um, just uh, a, pr a previous episode of this. Um, um, Stuart from Mogwai. I spoke uh, to Stuart from Mogwai and he had a Burzum record and he essentially bought a new car. He sold his Burzum record and bought a car because it was worth so much. <laughs> he said, he's, he, he, yeah, he's, he, he compared it to Nazi gold, <laughs> just, you know, selling this record just to get, the rid get rid of it, but made so much money he bought a car. Yeah, well, unfortunately, those things are worth a lot of money. However, I would say um, at least the money went to Stuart and hopefully he put it to a good use rather than it going to the artist who created it, who would certainly not put it to good use. Um, I think I think donation of funds earned from uh, from Burzum Records to worthwhile organizations could be another uh, good repurposing of resources. <laughs> so I think... Um... I've got a feeling the first time I saw you play, Mogwai picked you for ATP. Yep, that's right. And uh, we toured with them uh, over here in the US for a short run as well, which at the time was great for us. Um, and you referenced this earlier, there was a lot of people um, who were getting into our music who were not strictly from the realm of metal. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, as much as metal is my home base in many ways, I have so many other areas of musical interest mm. and um, it's, it's 
important to me that my music reaches beyond the boundaries of metal as well, because I don't feel like it is, I don't make it for a one specific audience. I make it for people who find something resonant in it. So for me, it's important to be able to reach beyond those kind of limited boundaries um, and, and find ways to connect with people who exist outside of that world. Um, yeah, so that, you know, that makes that, sense because when, um, especially Oceanic, when that one appeared, that did certainly hit with the Mogwai type person over here, the Mogwai type fan or whatever. It was there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah, that makes sense to me. And again, part of that also connects to other things we were discussing earlier. Circle, um, Circle was my introduction to Krautrock, and given they weren't a, a first generation um, uh, creator of that style, but uh, you know, the, the, listening to them was what brought me to listening to things like Noi and and. Right. and hearing things to, that already appealed to me, but in a way that I didn't know existed necessarily, like the, the, the use of um, repetitive, almost ritualistic patterns within music and yeah. um, the idea of being able to enter sort of hypnotic transcendental states through the use of repetition. And so, you know, that again was another factor in terms of what fed into what ISIS was doing, was, mm -hmm. was discovering these other things that could work within that framework, even if it was based off an, an initial background in metal and hardcore. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, being from, yeah, to talk of hardcore, being from Boston, hardcore's a big deal there, right? It certainly was. Like, I don't know how it many was. Yeah, it was. And we also didn't feel very connected to it for the most part. Um, I mean, you know, there were there were bands that we were connected to for sure. Um, Cave In maybe most notably who we toured with early on. Mm -hmm. And they, um, you know, they they definitely started from kind of a hardcore platform and then evolved into whatever it was they became. Yeah. But in their case, as well as ours, um, neither band was initially embraced by what would have been recognized at that time sort of the 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 beating heart of the hot, the boston hardcore scene a lot of those people just thought our bands were bullshit and avoided us and your prog rock mate <laughs> yeah or whatever i mean you know neither band had a comfortable home within any particular niche at that point and it really took a while of kind of just like beating down our own trail to get other people interested in what we were doing. It, it feels like the, the Hydrahead world was the world that you built. And it was- To some extent, yeah. And it was also just about, again, making connections with different bands. I mean, uh, Botch was a West Coast band, very distant from where we were geographically. Um, but, you know, that connection made a lot of sense. And uh, I think it was really just about finding our people um but it's funny too like a lot you know the boston hardcore thing has been brought up a lot over the years um and people can look at that moment in in you know kind of american hardcore history or whatever and see that there was a lot of activity in boston at the time and it's true um but at the same time it didn't always feel connected it was like you know it was like completely separate worlds to some degree yeah. and there was there was people that were um actively disinterested in the other various sectors that were operating at that time. Right, right. Um, I mean, for instance, we Hydra had shared an office with uh, Bridge Nine, who are like a very, yeah. you know, kind of um, traditional hardcore label, and we got along great. But the realms that we were operating in were very different. And there was almost no crossover in terms of the audience, even though we were all cooperating on kind of a uh, uh, practical level. Did you ever compare your mailing lists and not find a single person? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think we ever dug into our, our demographics too deeply, but we just could tell by going to shows, it was like completely different crowds. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, there was something, there may have been some crossover here and there, and there were certainly mixed bills at time. I mean, you know, there were bills where like, Converge would play with Dead Guy, and then you know Hatebreed would also be on the bill, for instance. Right. And you know those kind, of, or there were fests like the uh, the Metal Fest that would happen in Worcester, Massachusetts, every year. And of course, you know, again, like Hatebreed would play, and Anal Cunt would play, and Exhumed would play, but that was like a festival setting. 
-hmm. when it got down to the sort of more micro level, there really just wasn't a lot of crossover in many instances. Mm -hmm. There's a band I'm conflicted about. Anal cunt. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, well, that guy was certainly looking for people to be (laughs) conflicted. I mean, he was an agitator in every every sense of the word, Um, not just as a performer Mm -hmm. and um, as a as a member of that band, but also just as a showgoer. I mean, there was many a show I went to in Boston where he was in the crowd, purposely just trying to piss off the crowd, the performer, whoever he could. Um, fortunately, it was entertaining most of the time. Uh, I'll bring up one more record, completely disconnected from everything we've been discussing in most ways. Uh, also a new discovery for me, but not necessarily a new record. And it's this Nico Desert Shore record. Ooh, all right, yeah. Um, and it is a little connected to what we were just discussing in that Steve Brodsky from cave turned me on to that record. Um, I have never been a massive uh Velvet Underground fan. I understand the relevance to some degree. Um, And I think John Cale is a very interesting uh, producer and musician, but their music and Lou Reed's whole thing is just never, it doesn't appeal to me. What about Lulu? Just while we're here. Oh, shit. (laughs) (laughs) Lulu. Uh, I've had so many discussions about Lulu. I... I love that record and not because it's like a thing I always want to listen to, but just the fact that it exists. um, The fact that the elements seem so oddly mismatched. um, There's moments that are completely wince inducing that are just like, you almost have to just hold your hand back from the skip button um, and endure it. But then there's other moments too, where it's like, it's actually really good. And I'm sure many people would argue that with me, but I was even just thinking about like, I don't remember, it's like maybe the third or fourth track on Lulu. And Metallica as the backup band is just playing this one thrash riff over and over. And it's almost like a circle song from the thrash metal, like sort of the metal period of of circle where they were doing like, sort of like almost like kraut rock structures, but with thrash metal riffs. And then Lou is just doing his his like senile rambling over top, and it's it's a really interesting piece of music. Um, and then there's also these moments that are mostly interludes that are more orchestrated, which I have the feeling Lou is behind. And those moments are actually quite good as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, just the fact that it exists and that it was a thing that was sold to people um, <laughs> on that level is very very compelling. Yeah, like what did Metallica fans think? What did Lou Reed fans think? And what does do Metallica the band think now about it? Yeah, I, I don't I don't know the answer to any of those things. Um, I did get lost one day scrolling through the YouTube comments uh, below somebody's post of the full album, and it was very engaging. Um, I tend to stay away from the YouTube comment zone, but that was well worth the dive. <laughs> So, sorry, I, yeah, you're talking about that Nico record. I, I yeah, the Nico that. record. Um, so yeah, Velvet Underground, not so interesting to me. Peripheral things, however, some of Kale's solo stuff, his collaborations, and also this Nico solo record is absolutely fantastic. Mm-hmm. Just um, really, again, I know I've kind of harped on this with other artists, but um, things that don't comfortably exist within one identifiable genre yet, however, simultaneously have a very distinct and cohesive sound of their own. And that's what this Nico record is. I mean, there's, her voice delivers some very pop-ish melodies and a lot of the tracks are short, but there's a lot of drone elements to the record. There's an element of it that feels like and occasionally sounds like some of Arvo Parr's choral music. Um, and it's just a, an amalgam of, of different things that I like all presented in one place in a way that I never imagined mm. until hearing it. And it was just, again, it felt like, I love encountering a record that feels like 
It was just something that the person channeled. It was all there and all they had to do was just siphon that into themselves and project it outwards. And that's what that record feels like to me. Um, and it, uh, <laughs> it's one of those things that I can just listen to in a lot of different settings and it's almost always a great listen and something I find myself going back to. Um, and it's harder for me now to get into records than it was when I was young. I'm a lot less open than I used to be, I think, in some ways. I mean, I'm constantly searching out new music, but it's rare that a record really gets me. There's a lot of things I enjoy and will listen to a handful of times, but there's few that at this stage in my life I get, I get into them and then I go back to them repeatedly, but that's been one of them. That's interesting because that's probably the case with me. The irony being my taste is broader. Yeah, yeah, same. So I've got to plug in the computer before it dies and shuts us off. Panic. Uh, um, yeah, same. My tastes are broader, but the things that are the most, um, the things that are the most deeply satisfying are, are few and, not few and far between, but just there's less of re those really profound experiences than there used to be. Yeah, 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 maybe maybe we were more spongy when we were young and could absorb it and really like listen and listen and listen. Right? Yeah, I think that's a part of it. And I think part of it's just also the modern condition of massive availability. There's just so many things to listen to. And I'm, I'm really curious. I'm just a curious listener. So if there's ever something that somebody recommends or that I stumble across or, um, you know, uh, just somehow is presented to me into some, in some way or another, I start falling down holes and looking at the labels that released it and then seeing what else those labels do or seeing what other projects the artists are involved in. And I'm, I'm, I'm very curious in that way. So part of it is just like that avid curiosity keeps me away from just focusing on one record a lot of the time, for better or for worse. Exactly the same. I find, I find within 20 minutes, I've found out the whole history of the artist but not yeah. listen to a whole song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's I think that's valid too. I think the the, the people who make the music are uh, as interesting to me as the music itself and often the two inform each other. Yeah. And this goes back to some of the records we discussed at least um, and and I can think of of uh, one in particular to highlight um, and that is again, uh, UC and the whole crew behind Circle and Pharaoh Overlord. Um, UC's music and Circle's music was what brought me into contact with them. Um, and uh, it was also the beginning of a, of a very deep friendship. And now the two are inextricably linked for me. And I think that that, that sort of convergence of friendship and, and creative parallel is where I find myself in life in terms of what's the most important to me. Um, and, and the music is enriched by knowing the people behind it and knowing the music is what gives me insight into the people themselves. And um, it's just a really, it's an interesting way to navigate humanity and to, to essentially socialize. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I agree, yeah, I agree. And uh, on that note, if anyone's not listened to this, just as a reminder, please do go and <laughs> check it out. <laughs> um, so um, I think um, I think we should probably leave it because we've been going on for quite a while, but um, it's been awesome talking. Yeah, likewise. Thank you for initiating this. I, um, I miss being uh, with my friends and talking about records. There's a few people who you know, we'd go to each other's houses and sit around and listen to records. And the main thing is traveling around in a vehicle with my bandmates and playing records for each other. And I really miss that. So it's nice to be able to do things like this in the interim. Yeah, yeah exactly the same. So any plans for the future? What, what have you got lined up? Um, let's see. Uh, Mammifer will be recording in an actual studio next month, which will be our first studio recording since lockdown everything else has been at home um i've been working at things on the home studio as well i have a solo record that was started in studio and is being finished at home uh hopefully that'll be out this year 
Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, there's many records that are in various stages at the pressing plant uh, for Siege. And um, hopefully Sumac will be able to get together in person. Our uh, Nick is in, is in Canada and we're stateside and currently we're not able to see one another. Mm. Um, I could go up there, but I would have to quarantine for whatever it is, two weeks, which is you know, on a practical level impossible, but I'll be working on material until we can get together in person, hopefully this summer. Um, you know, you'll have and, enough stockpile for a, quarter, a sort of a quadruple album. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and um, you know, there's there's tour plans for 2022, but I am not counting on anything happening. No. Um, I, it's and I'll be a, a believe it when I see it kind of thing. So I'd like to think that's possible, and I won't be shocked if it doesn't happen. I think everyone's in that boat. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's best to be best to not like have all your eggs in the basket isn't it? yeah mm. okay really good talking loved it thanks a lot likewise thanks joe let's um we're going to wave goodbye and then i'm going to press stop we can say goodbye properly afterwards okay but we'll wave goodbye and i'll press stop all right <laughs>